Welcome everyone to the Berlin Functional Programming Group. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce our first ever speaker from Berlin and our first speaker on F Sharp. Uh, sometimes people mistake this for a Haskell meetup and it's, it's not supposed to be a Haskell meetup. It's really meant to be a functional programming meetup. It just so happens that Haskell looms large in the functional programming world. So I, I'm, I'm extra pleased to have a representative from an entirely different planet, the, uh, I guess the .NET planet. And also that it's a Berliner who's going to introduce us to this topic. Daniel Bachler, who is the CTO of Edelweiss Connect, and uh, maybe he's hiring. He can let us know if he wants to um, at some point. Otherwise, I'm just very uh, pleased and honored to have him. I think he has his own meetup in Berlin as well that he may want to let you know about um, the friendly functional meetup, I think it's called. Yes. And uh, I think that, you know, it's nice that he is willing to do a talk for this meetup. Um, it's funny because when I started this meetup, I thought I need a friendlier meetup for teaching functional programming. And it's like, you can't get friendly enough. You have to literally put it in the name if you're going to get people to, um, to brave the wilds of, uh, of monads and functors and category theory. So I appreciate his efforts to, to, uh, to attract beginners and to spread knowledge. And I think that's what his intention is tonight to spread knowledge about F sharp. So, uh, with that introduction out of the way, I will hand it over to Daniel. And Daniel, it's uh, so nice to have you. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to actually, maybe I can remove Spotlight for me. And I think you have it. It's all yours. Perfect. OK, thanks a lot, Stephen. Um, yeah. Uh... And thanks a lot for, for making this wonderful meetup. Um, I mean, uh, as I said before, I think you had fantastic uh, talks, uh, especially now in the last uh, couple of um, months. Uh, I've seen only a few of those, but those, those were all excellent. I'm very honored to be uh, able to be part of that uh, group here now. Um, so if you if you if it's the first uh, time that you join this meetup, then definitely check out the YouTube channel. There's been some fantastic talks lately. Uh, yeah, the, the meetup that you mentioned is the uh, friendly uh, functional programming meetup Berlin. And uh, as you said, like uh, I wanted it to be so explicit that I put it in a name. Um, we don't do uh, online meetups, but if you're in Berlin, once we can resume uh, in-person meetings again, uh, definitely drop by. We try to have a look at different functional programming languages um, and uh, try to do a different aspect uh, of functional programming every time or something like that. So that that's also um, a nice angle that, that I've enjoyed. Okay, so for tonight, um, F sharp, uh, a brief introduction. Um, the talk is probably going to be about 50 minutes or so, maybe 55, we'll see. Um, and uh, as uh, Stephen said, if there's any questions, just type them into the chat and we can um, have a, a couple of breaks maybe in between and, and we can clarify things or have uh, bigger questions at the end. Good, let's jump uh, in. Quick overview maybe for how the talk will go. I'll do um, a quick tour of the language. Um, just a couple of slides uh, to go through so that everyone can follow, especially if, you, if you're not so familiar yet with uh, ML family la um, style languages. Um, there's gonna be a couple of slides towards the end that are also gonna be uh, maybe uh, nice for the, the people in the audience who do have Haskell experience. Uh, the beginning of course will, is, is pretty standard fare. Um, and then we'll have a walkthrough with a practical example where I'll just show in an editor uh, what this looks like, um, how you can use it, and um, um, yeah, just a, a, a small practical look at some real world code. And then we can have a few more questions and answers in the end. Um, so yeah, I wanted to collect uh, and, and start out with this with just a, a small collection of things that I like about F Sharp. Um, one of the things that I like about it is that it can be used in a lot of different scenarios. So uh, F-Sharp is a language that you can write console applications with or cross-platform native UI apps if you want, or you can just write small scripts um, that, that you run inter like um, without compiling them beforehand. You can write web applications or web UIs that run in the browser. You can do data science notebooks. Um, so it's, it's really a relatively versatile language uh, in that sense. Um, it has algebraic data types. Um, well, if you don't know that term, don't worry about it. We'll come back to it later. 
uh, and type inference. And uh, in my experience, that leads to um, a very high productivity and uh, doesn't slow you down over time in uh, development speed. So my experience with, um, so I've, I like a lot of other functional programming languages as well. Um, I also like some non-functional programming languages like Python, for example, is also a nice language. Um, but my experience is that as, for example, Python code bases grow, it, as they become bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more tedious to refactor. And so you do it less um, because uh, it kind of slows you down, like um, thinking about all the edge cases that you may now introduce anew and so forth. And my experience with um, programming languages that do have algebraic data types is that that happens a lot less and uh, refactorings are a lot safer. And so you can retain a higher development speed over the course of the project. Um, a sharp defaults to immutability um, for all the values. Um, and it kind of pushes this uh, concept of just write functions and have data and uh, don't get too much distracted into building object-oriented type hierarchies and so forth um, with, um, uh, with inheritance and so forth. Um, that being said, it does support both mutability and object-oriented features because there are cases where this is really nice to have. But uh, it kind of pushes you towards this um, this this er this world of like let's try to model things with uh, functions and data and immutable um, data structures. And finally, it has a really nice community. Um, so there's uh, the community is not super large, but it's been uh, growing. Um, I think. Five years ago, there was this common joke, like uh, all the F-sharp uh, -sharp programmers, all 12 of us. Um, by now, the community is, is quite um, nice. Um, there's a couple of companies that use it. Um, the company that I work for uh, uses it. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's growing. There's a growing ecosystem of libraries. But it can also, because it lives in the .NET ecosystem, can use all the libraries of this very large ecosystem. It also compiles to JavaScript uh, since 2015 or so. Uh, so if you live in that world, you can use the entire JavaScript uh, ecosystem relatively effortlessly. And um, so it's it's not such a big deal as, as with some other languages that the community is, is small, but the uh, community is great. Um, OK, let's jump into the language. So um, here's just how you define a bunch of values, um, Boolean, int, float, string. Um, the most interesting maybe in line five, this is how you do type annotations for um, uh, variables in F sharp. So uh, unlike Haskell or Elm, where you have basically a, a separate um, annotation uh, syntax that has a, has its own way of, of um, uh, um, explaining the types, um, it's embedded in F sharp. So you usually use parentheses and then the column to give the type for uh, various uh, variables. Um, and then there's a tuple uh, definition. And yeah, so it's pretty straightforward, uh, I think. Uh, then you have a list. So lists in F-sharp are single linked lists um, that are immutable. So here you can see list A defines one, two, three. You can also uh, omit the semicolon uh, if you use a new line instead. So for sometimes that's quite nice. It's uh, how the uh, DSL uh, works for, uh, for example, for uh, writing React style uh, web apps. Uh, this is used a lot. Uh, and then there is a, another syntax that I, I show here because we're going to see an example later on that uses it. Uh, this is how um, you uh, add one element to the head of, of, a, of a new uh, list. And uh, as I said, lists are immutable. So uh, you always create a new uh, list like this, uh, for example, in list C here. Uh, then we have arrays. Uh, arrays are um, fixed length uh, and mutable. This is a bit strange, but that's because the underlying um, array uh, primitive in the .NET framework is mutable uh, fixed size arrays, uh, and those are indexable. So in line 12, you can see how you access the second element in an array. OK, so uh, so far, uh, so, so easy. Uh, now, if you've seen any kind of ML language before, then um, of course, you, you'll be used to how functions look like in F-sharp. But if you haven't, then I, I uh, saw at some point that sometimes it confuses people a bit, like how, how should they read this? And I found that this is a relatively useful way for them to uh, create this mental bridge of how this works. So here's a function definition in JavaScript. And uh, in F-sharp, basically what you do is you uh, get rid of the cruft, uh, so the curly braces and so forth, uh, and then you just uh, rearrange it a little. And, and that's what a function definition for add numbers with two arguments looks like in F-sharp. Um, notice that there is no return statement. So functions just evaluate to the last uh, uh, expression. Um, 
And um, also this is a function that uh, takes two parameters. And so when you call it, uh, like in line five, um, you have to supply all the, uh, the arguments. Um, there's also current uh, functions and partial uh, application, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, also, F sharp is white space sensitive. So in line two, you have to use uh, spaces to indent this, um, spaces, not tabs. Um, and this also, this is something that some people find weird in the beginning, but if you've ever used Python, uh, then of course you're already used to this. And I find that this is much less of a problem than I initially thought seven years ago when I came from C sharp. Um, this is how you do type annotations again. So uh, first and second are both ints and then the return type of the entire function is an int as well. Okay. Um, Quickly occurring in partial application. So uh, notice the uh, subtle change here. So instead of the semicolon that uh, separated the two uh, arguments before, now we have the first and then the second uh, given separately. And this makes add numbers now a curried function. Um, and this means that it's actually a function that takes exactly one argument, which is the first int, and then returns a function that takes one argument, which is an int, and returns an int. And if you use it like this, like in line five, it doesn't look so different. Um, I mean, basically almost the same in, in the outcome. But what you can do with curried functions is that you can uh, do something called partial application. And that is you give only some of the arguments and leave some others open. And that means that you st still have a function uh, uh, that you get out of this that you can apply the rest of the arguments to. So we create this function led at five by taking add numbers, which actually takes two uh, arguments, we only apply the first one. So it now becomes a function that will always have five in the first uh, position. And then if we call it with add five and uh, we apply the argument 10, then uh, it evaluates to 15. And it's very useful for scenarios where in object-oriented languages, you would use something like uh, dependency injection. And you can do that with uh, occurring in partially applied functions in, I think, a nicer way often. Okay, records, again, not a very uh, terribly exciting uh, feature. Lots of languages have this. Uh, so this just creates a bunch of fields that are named and they all have different uh, data types. Uh, they're immutable in F sharp. Um, so here we create first a type called person with first name string, last name string, year of birth is int. And then we create a value of that and a function that prints it. You can also see in line 13 that uh, printf n, um, this is actually type checked. Um, so it understands the literal that's passed in here. And then it says, okay, percent %s, percent %s, percent %d. So I expect three parameters. Uh, the first two have to be of type string and the last one has to be of type int. So it will type check that for you. And if something doesn't match up here, it would give a compile time error. Uh, then we print it. And in the last uh, two lines, you can see how you create a new immutable value by making a copy of an existing one and changing one of the fields. OK. So we have a question Yes. about the uh, currying of functions. Mm -hmm. um, Ulrich, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi, just a very maybe straightforward or simple question. Why, why have two different types of functions? What's the point of having uncurried and curried? Um, so one is, so um, F sharp lives in the .NET framework and the .NET framework doesn't usually uh, use curried functions. So um, all the functions that come from the normal .NET framework um, are uh, basically done like this. So you also have to also always apply all the arguments. In uh, functional programming languages, like in the tradition of, of uh, ML and, and OCaml, which inspired F sharp a lot, uh, current functions are used quite a bit. And so that's why they implemented uh, this as well. And it has a couple of really nice uses. Um, maybe at the end, we can look at another uh, example that, that of maybe a motivating use of, of how that can uh, be, be uh, put to use. Make sense? Yep, thanks. Cool. OK. Um, discriminated unions. Whoop, that was one too far. Um, this is where I wanted to go. Um, so here, this is a very simple case of a discriminated union. So these are types where um, you specify all the cases that are possible. And then any value of this type can only have one of these, in this case, four uh, cases, up, right, left, and down. Um, if you use them like this, then they're not really that different from enum types that you have in all kinds of languages, in Java and in C-sharp and so forth. Um, 
but they are quite a bit more powerful uh, if you look at them uh, when they're used like this. So here we define a type status, which is a discriminated union, and it's uh, a generic or um, uses parametric uh, polymorphism. So there is a type variable now that's denominated by this tick uh, and then the name of the variable. Um, so this can then, when you actually instantiate a type of status, you can use, uh, you can make a status of int where the success uh, value will be an integer or a person or a string or whatever. Um, so what we do here is we define four cases. Uh, the first one is just as before, just a label basically, uh, pending. But then we have running and that takes a tuple of two ints. So it's, uh, we call them current and total, but it's basically we'll always like if it's in the running uh, case, um, then it will always have these two uh, integers that it carries with it. If it's a success case, it will always have a value of this uh, success type uh, variable type. And if it's the error case, then it will always carry a string explaining uh, the error of it. And the nice thing about this is, so if you've uh, not used uh, languages like this, then um, maybe it's, uh, so for Haskellus, this is maybe a bit boring, but uh, if you've never used a language like this, then let me tell you that this is like a wonderful feature that I wish all, basically all programming languages had, because it allows you to be very precise uh, whenever you um, use values uh, that try to model things that are, that, that were not all the values are present all the time, which is actually almost all of them. Um, and so uh, if you have discriminated unions like this or some types as they're called, then you can do things like here where whenever we want to use a variable of this type, like here with status, we have to tell the compiler what to do in each one of these uh, cases. And if, uh, if here, for example, we just try to print them. So if we pattern match on status, if it's the pending case, then we just print pending. Here we do something special. We say, if we are in the running state, and the first of the tuple values is exactly zero, then we wanna give a name to the second of the uh, two uh, tuple values. Uh, we wanna name that n and use it now. Then we print of n starting with first item of n. Um, so this pattern matches only if the first tuple value is exactly zero. And then you can already see this process is top to bottom. If it's not zero, the first, uh, if, so if it's in a running state, but the first value is not zero, then we uh, assign the, var the variable name i to the first tuple value, n to the second tuple value, and then we uh, print processing i of n basically. The success case, we also, we just uh, printed out in this case, we use percent %o to just call to string on it and be done with it and the error message. And then at the top, uh, at the bottom, you see uh, how uh, you would call a function like this and, and construct two such values. And having this is um, like, it doesn't look like much maybe here, but it's very powerful um, as, a, as a language feature to just model the real world a lot closer to reality. And you can do something like this with other languages that don't have it sometimes with like class hierarchies and trying to use inheritance. But in my experience, like this is often much nicer and, and less prone to errors uh, as you extend it because one of the nice things um, that's maybe also important to do to know is that if you add a new case here, so for example, let's say we add a new case retrying uh, and with a timestamp and a retry count or something like that, then all the uses in the entire program where we use a, a value of this type, it would highlight now the compiler would give us an error and say, hey, you're not, using, you're not uh, telling me what I should do if we're in the retrying case here. And so this is very one of these features that I said in the beginning is very nice for um, making um, using these programming languages for software as it gets larger and still maintaining the same development speed. Um, okay, again, just because we'll we'll see this later, this is uh, the option type and the result type. So again, if you're used to Haskell, uh, then you know these as maybe and either. Um, this is our very simple discriminated union types that are defined in a standard library. They're used to indicate either the absence of a value, um, but on a type level. So instead of languages where null can always be a possible value, um, in F sharp, it's usually modeled in this way that you explicitly say, for example, I don't know, maybe the age is not always given, then you would say option of int or something like that. And then whenever you try to access this age variable, then you would have to tell the compiler what do I want to do if it's given and what do I want to do if it's not given. Uh, result is very similar, but it has an okay and an error. And both of these have a payload. They can be of different types. And that's very useful um, because then you can communicate the error condition better. So um, this is uh, nice if you uh, don't just want to indicate the absence of, of a working um, 
computation, but want to communicate to the user maybe like why did this not work. So here we have an example with two divisions, um, safe division uh, and safe division two. One returns an option, so it communicates on the float uh, on the uh, type level. Uh, in the return type that this may or may not work. Um, and then safe division two, which uses the result type to actually give uh, an, an error message in this case. Okay, so we're getting uh, soon to the more exciting stuff. Um, just uh, for completeness sake, there's also exceptions in language um, because the .NET framework has exceptions. Um, just, I wanted to bring this example just because, so, so you see also the benefit maybe of the uh, results and, and, um, uh, and option types before. Um, with exceptions, you don't see anywhere on the type level that this thing might throw, right? So uh, if you write the do calculation uh, function and you don't know about the implementation of divide, um, you will not necessarily know that this might throw a divide by zero exception. And when it does, it just goes all the way uh, in a call stack up to the uh, highest point and might even crash your application if you don't catch it. And um, for some kinds of errors, that's okay. Like if you really rely on, for example, being, able, uh, being um, uh, able in your program to open a network socket and that doesn't work for some reason, maybe an exception and tearing down the program is not a bad way to solve this. But it's a bit of a downside of the .NET framework and how it's laid out that this is not really communicated anywhere on the type level. And also on the documentation, it's a bit sketchy with how diligent different library authors are in communicating which kinds of exceptions can uh, different library functions can throw. But it's something you have to live with. And uh, so I thought it's, it's good to mention. How are we doing for time? Okay. Um, mutation. So I said that in the beginning, um, we have, uh, we can declare variables as mutable and we have uh, loops. So this is something that in languages like Haskell, for example, you don't have, and there you have to write everything with uh, folds instead. Um, or reduce functions as they're sometimes known. Um, that also works in F-sharp, of course, but F-sharp also gives you the um, possibility to write loops. And sometimes, as I had before, it, some algorithms are just a bit nicer to express in this way. Um, you'll also see that um, where we assign in the last uh, line of the while loop, uh, where we assign a new value to i, um, that this doesn't use the equal sign, it uses the left error. So assigning to mutable fields uses the left arrow, not the equal sign. Uh, and then uh, below, uh, this is how you would uh, start a new process in the .NET framework. So we instantiate the class process from the system diagnostics uh, namespace. We set two mutable fields, file name and create no window. And then we started to kick off the process. Okay, um, we're, let's, let's go to some of the less common features. Um, are there any questions in the chat or? Otherwise, I would go straight ahead. Um, no questions so far. Although Eric, <clears throat> Eric had a question that's kind of a general question. I mean, mm -hmm. now is as good a time as any, Eric, if you'd like to ask it. Uh, okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, I was wondering if you uh, give your thoughts and compare and contrast the the different hosts that um, uh, the languages used uh, .NET versus the JVM. Um, yeah, so that's mostly for historical reasons. I don't think that there is an implementation of uh, F sharp that runs on the JVM. Um, so for historical reasons, the the history of F sharp was basically that um, when it was created, like the work started on in, in the late 90s. The idea was that Microsoft wanted to have a competitor to Java um, with, that was going to be C sharp. And it wanted to have a runtime with it with relatively similar characteristics to the JVM. Uh, which was the .NET uh, framework, the original one on, that was Windows only. And um, that was basically also bytecode and so forth. It was a, designed to be a bit more multi-language. So it had more metadata in the beginning than Java. Um, and, sorry, someone is not Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically the genesis of it. And then um, and very early on uh, in the late 90s or early 2000s, I think Microsoft had this uh, ambition to try and create a, uh, an OCaml basically for the .NET framework. And that's what F Sharp came to be. And now with the .NET Core being this nice multi-platform uh, uh, re-implementation that's uh, open source, um, it has become a lot more attractive in the last uh, couple of years, the .NET uh, Core framework. 
But um, basically, that's the genesis and why F# -sharp, um, exists and why it exists in the .NET framework, but uh, not on um, the JVM. Um, there's also the other compiler that uh, backend that compiles to JavaScript, and we'll have a look at that uh, in a bit. Can I can I ask a kind of a follow up? Maybe maybe this is what I would have asked: is which one do you like better? Because I noticed you've used both of them in the past. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show some code in the in the end that uh, will maybe make this a bit clearer. So um, okay. let me come back to that in the end. Thank you. Okay, so some less common features. Um, okay, so the Haskellers in the audience will know where this is going. Um, but I wanted to start this particular part with a motivating example. So let's say you have a function that creates a person. Um, it inspects the HTTP context. So this is in the context of an HTTP server, uh, some function that uh, does this here. And we want to return an, uh, a person, but it may or may not work. So we return an option of person. And then we have uh, this function, try get query param, which tries, uh, looks in the, um, in the query parameters of the URL. Uh, for a certain key. And if it's there, then it returns some and the content of that uh, key. And if it's not there, then it returns none. And um, here we do this three times with three different values. And then um, all of these are options, right? So the type every time of these is option of string. Um, and then in line six, we pattern match on a tuple that we create um, with these three option values. And then in line seven, we make one pattern match where we say, if all of these three values are exactly the sum value, then we want to give a name of what's in each of these, first name, last name, and year born. And then we create in line eight to 10, a new record with these three values, and we return the whole thing as a sum value, right? So in the, in the end, because we're not just returning a person, we're returning an option of person, we return sum and that new person value. And in any of the other seven cases, right? So each of these uh, three, um, um, uh, uh, three option values can be none. If I, any of those or all of those are none, then we want to return none. Okay, so this gets the job done. Uh, it works well enough for uh, three cases like we have here. But if this uh, ends up being 10 fields that we do like this, then it kind of gets annoying to, to deal with this kind of um, scenario. And so wouldn't it be nice if we had a way that a library could provide blocks that define new semantics for sequencing expressions? So in our case, what we would actually maybe like to do is we say, um, let's just try uh, a bunch of, um, uh, try to call a bunch of functions and uh, just in sequence. And if any of them return none, then let's just go to the end. There's no, no point in, in trying any further. Let's just return none for the whole thing. Um, but if that's not the case, then we want to proceed all the way down and then construct a new value and return that. And that is exactly what computation expressions give you. So you see here that in line two, we have this option thing and then curly braces. Um, and this is now using the computation expression for option. And computation expressions are always used to create one um, particular type, in this case, the option type. So this entire block will create an option value. And the nice thing about it is that we now have this let bang syntax that's uh, different from the normal let. And the let bang is uh, basically tells the computation expression, so you please decide how we should proceed now. And so what's happening here is that uh, in line three, it will take context, try, get, query, param, first name, that still returns an option value. And then it tells the computation expression uh, option that's implemented somewhere as a library code. Please, like, how should we proceed with this? And the implementation of this particular one will say, if we're in the sum case, then we take the value and we assign it to first name. And in a none case, we just directly return none. And we do that three times with different uh, query params. And then uh, we, as you can see, the, the type of first name, last name, and year born is now not option of string because the computation expression already took care of that, that this might be an option and we only, ever get there into the respective uh, positions if it was actually the sum case. And so in the end, we can just um, create this new value for person and use return, which is a keyword that is specific for computation expressions in F sharp. It's not a return in the control flow kind of uh, way that you're used to it, maybe from uh, Java or C++. 
Um, and then we return just says like wrap this in the default value for this option uh, type that, or, or this type of the computation expression, which in this case is option. And so here we return some of this person value. Okay, so I hope this is more or less clear. If it's not, just uh, uh, go along with me. I'll show you two more uh, computation expressions. Maybe uh, the pattern will sink in. And for the Haskellers uh, in the audience, uh, I have uh, a couple of uh, um, maybe interesting points uh, that, that will come in the next two slides of why this is not exactly monads and do notation. Okay. Uh, here is a very similar ex uh, example. So we have a function that, that's uh, retrieved from remote store. So it does some network request. And so it returns async. And um, in this case, we assume that it doesn't fail. Um, it's just uh, async. Uh, async is uh, like promises or tasks in other programming languages. So it's a, a type to represent things that will take some time. And at some point in the future, they will um, um, return to us this uh, value, uh, in this case, a string value. Um, and so now our create person uses uh, in line five, a different uh, computation expression, in this case, async. And it, uh, the structure is pretty much the same thing. So what we want to do is we want to retrieve from remote store the first name and then the last name and then the year born. And then we want to um, basically in this case now wait for all of these to, to happen. And then we want to uh, return the, a person in this, again, wrapped in async. Um, but the async computation expression is implemented a bit differently. And what it will do is it will say, okay, we have a function that produces an async value. So let's um, give, let, let's put that on the thread pool somewhere to execute and register a callback so that whenever this function is done, it will call me back and then I can take the value, assign it to first name and continue in the function, right? And so this is, um, the nice thing about this is that this is all just library code. You could write your own implementation for the async computation expression that does this kind of stuff. And there are other uh, task libraries basically in, in F Sharp that, that do this for specific reasons. Um, but the cool thing about F Sharp and, and how it does it here is that as opposed to other languages that have async await like C Sharp or uh, TypeScript or Python now, nowadays, um, this doesn't uh, necess necessitate to change the language in any way, right? It's just something that because of the flexibility that computation expressions give you can be implemented as library code. And of course, the Haskell people have worked this out uh, a long time ago. Um, but uh, computation expressions, they do map very closely to monads and do expressions, um, and, and do notation. But they're also a little different because there's a bunch of uh, additional things that computation expressions can define. So there's like 10 or so functions that they can additionally define in addition to bind and return. Um, and they allow you to. Um, modify the behavior for certain special constructs that you don't have in Haskell. Like for example, um, you can specify how this uh, computation expression should deal with loops, or you can say, what should you do if there's an exception, right? So if uh, here in this case of the async exceptions, uh, all of the, uh, like the retrieve from remote store might throw an exception, but that happens somewhere on the thread pool, but we will probably want to capture this, uh, transfer it over to our thread here and then re-raise the exception uh, so that the normal uh, exception handling uh, code works as expected. And so it's, it's very similar to monads and do notation, but a bit more. Um, we have last... a couple of questions. Yes. <clears throat> um, Ulrich had another question. If you would like to, yeah, just because you you mentioned uh, the async expression at all, does it do eventual programming like like JavaScript or Node? Like you have a, a an event loop, or you mentioned thread pool. So is it truly concurrent? Um, it is truly concurrent. So the .NET uh, uh, runtime is uh, multi-threaded and uh, it maintains a thread pool and the async computations are scheduled there. And you can also start these in parallel. So I'm only showing here how to do them in sequence, but there is a, a syntax also to say, run all of these and then when they're all done, um, come back to me basically. Okay, okay and there's one more question from Mika. 
Hi. Um, yeah, I, I think I saw it briefly in, a, in an earlier slide, but are our product type signatures in F-sharp written as like type star type rather than kind of like the more tuply way that like Haskell's might be used to? Yeah, so in, in, uh, in um, F-sharp, the uh, syntax for, what do I have it? Oh, it's, a, it's a bit back, but it's a star. Yeah, so it's like uh, if you have a, a tuple that's an int, a string, and a float, then it's int star string star float, basically. That's the syntax to define that this is a, a tuple of these particular three types. OK, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. OK, and it looks like Ulrich has one quick follow up. Sure. Because you were comparing the computation expressions to monads. So are there specific laws that hold for computation expressions and how you combine them? Now that you made up the comparison. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is sort of like, mm, not really. Uh, they're used in a pretty gung-ho way, I would say. Um, they're sometimes even used to define, um, so you you can, so, so I mentioned these uh, altogether 12-ish uh, functions. So you, I think you have to re implement return and bind for computation expressions. There's 10 more that you can implement, but they're optional. And then you can define your own um, uh, additional things that then look just like action verbs, basically, in these computation expressions. And they're used and abused for some strange things in some parts of the F-sharp uh, uh, universe. Um, and yeah, it's 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 a bit of a strange story. So if you're used to uh, monads and and how they're used in Haskell, where it's very principled, and as you say, like there is these like the monad laws and so forth that people adhere to, then you would maybe be a bit freaked out uh, with with what people do in the F sharp universe with them. Um, but most of the simpler ones that I tend to use mostly, they they do follow uh, basically the, these laws, even if they're not formal formulated as such usually. Does that answer the question roughly? Yep. Thanks. Cool. So. Okay. Thank you, Ulrich. Ulrich is one of our uh, most loyal customers at the meetup. Nice. Um, okay. So one more uh, computation expression. So this is uh, lazy sequences can also be done uh, or are also done as uh, computation expressions. So here we create a sequence of ints um, with the range expression. So this is uh, this particular one in line three is built in. Uh, this uh, will create a lazy sequence from one to five inclusive. Uh, and then B sequence um, is again a computational expression to create a sequence. Um, and this will, when it's consumed, yield first zero. And then it uses yield bang to yield all the elements of A sequence. And then once all of those are consumed, it will yield 23 and then it's done. Um, and so this is also something that you can do with uh, computational expressions. And um, there's also a, a whole kind of like query um, expression language that uses quotations to um, do computational expressions that can be at, then at runtime um, transformed into SQL uh, uh, expressions and stuff like that. But I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to show that today. Um, but there's basically some some uh, funky stuff that you can do with computation expressions. Um, but these are the three that I, I thought are uh, good to see to have seen um, so far. Um, I also have, if there's interest uh, after the talk, uh, we can have a look at how the option computation expression would be implemented if anyone uh, is interested in that kind of thing. Okay, um, I have to hurry up a bit. Um, units of measure. So this is a pretty uh, rare feature for uh, programming languages to have built in. Um, there is one programming language called Frank, F-R-E-N-K, which is sort of a special purpose language for dealing with unit and, uh, units of measures and dimensions. Um, that goes a bit further and is a bit more principled in what it, how, how it does it. Um, but F-sharp is one of the very few sort of mainstream-ish languages maybe um, that um, implement this. And what it gives you is that you can create these um, uh, units of measure. So here we do that for m for meter, sec for second, and kilogram, uh, kg for kilogram. And then you can annotate numeric types with this additional measure uh, annotation. And the interesting thing about this is that F sharp knows how to uh, transform these over arithmetic operations. And it will treat, uh, if you want to try to add two uh, different values together that have incompa incompatible um, measure uh, types, it will not let you do that. Uh, and if you divide or multiply, 
then it will track the resulting change in the unit as well. So you see, for example, in line 12, that I don't give any special and type annotation to tell uh, F-sharp that speed is m divided by sec. So basically, it's velocity. Uh, it has worked it out by itself by um, working through the, the type annotations here across uh, the division. And then you can see a few more examples of that further down. Um, this is very useful if you work for, with um, with physical units. Um, it is a bit limited in because it doesn't have a concept of dimension. So it doesn't know that if you have, for example, meter and kilometer, that these denominate the same underlying dimension, uh, whereas uh, meter and second are fundamentally different. Um, this is something that Frank can do, and then it can do automatic conversions better. But F Sharp gives you this built into the language to um, solve this particular case, right? So it's it's not as powerful as some other approaches to this, but it's quite useful for this particular problem when you have it of, of dealing with physical calcula uh, unit calculations. Okay, type providers. This is the last uh, main feature that I want to uh, show, and then. Um, there's a, a bit more about a, a template that I really like. Type providers are an interesting uh, approach to a problem where if you think about you get some data, like let's say some uh, JSON. And um, if you look at it uh, and it looks like there's an array and there's objects of it and they have the same shape. Um, and then in a language like Python, you would basically just say, okay, so I looked at this, um, I want to access it. I access it with uh, this, uh, like, this is an array and then I access the first element and then I want to access a particular field and you copy the string identifier and you put it into uh, like um, uh, the brackets and say, okay, this is my string literal. I just want to try to access that. And then you just hope that you didn't make a copy paste error and you work with it like that. And it's nice and it's fast, um, but it's uh, also you don't have any like uh, checks at uh, the authoring time of your script that this will actually match. Um, in typed languages, what you often do is that you define a type and then either you write manually the conversion function from the JSON that you get into those types, or sometimes in some languages you have some metaprogramming capabilities that automate that to some degree. That's of course nice. Um, but F Sharp um, tried a, a third way, so to speak, that's sort of in between, and that's type providers. And the idea here is that you point a um, uh, so a library can can provide a type provider, and they sort of work like a compiler plugin. And then you point them at an example piece of data, and they will look at it, uh, and then generate the types for you based on these uh, based on these uh, example data. So here I have a, an example for a CSV type provider that's uh, provided by the F# -sharp data library, and it's a very simple CSV for for our purposes here date minimum temperature, maximum temperature. And then we use in line six, we say we want to create a new type weather history. And we use the CSV provider and we point it to this file. And then the CSV provider will either run at compile time or in your editor session, it gets basically loaded by the F sharp editor plugin um, and then runs it co its code and looks at the example file and generates the types. <clears throat> um, you don't see these type definitions uh, directly, uh, but you can use them now. So in line 12, if you write weather history dot, it will tell you, okay, weather history has a load function. And then um, you can, you write, okay, load. And you wanna, let's say we load the same file. We could also load another file with the same structure. Um, and then in line 14, we iterate over these values. And in line 15, uh, at the, where you say, where I type row dot date, it knows that uh, there's only three fields that this uh, particular um, row type can have. And it would give you autocomplete for that. Um, you can also see that F sharp has these double back tick syntax. Um, and inside those, you can use whatever Unicode characters you want. Um, so this allows us to have variable names with spaces in them, or if you like, you can use emoji, stuff like that. Um, these type providers are a really interesting uh, approach. And for um, these kind of exploratory, I quickly have to get something done. They're really nice. For larger programs that have to live for and be maintained for a long time, 
I ended up not using them so much because um, they have a couple of downsides, like the compile times uh, get a bit longer and the versioning story of some of these type providers, because they behave sort of like compiler plugins. Um, the versioning story can be a bit um, annoying when new versions of the uh, .NET uh, framework, like major new versions or if the compiler come out or something like that, then sometimes it takes some time until they match up and so forth. So that can be a bit annoying. But for simple, quick analysis like that, it's really nice. OK, um, uh, this is the last thing um, that I want to show here. And then I want to switch into the um, example. So um, the safe stack is uh, not a language feature. It's just a, a template that the community built. But it's really nice in that it sets up for you a F Sharp uh, HTTP application uh, web server uh, that uses F Sharp um, and the front end. So this is a, a, a F Sharp code that transpiles to JavaScript with the Fable compiler readily set up. Um, and it gives you, uh, it uses React uh, in, in the st standard template setup for rendering and uh, state manage, um, Elmish for state management. So this is uh, a library in F Sharp uh, that is inspired by Elm and the Elm architecture. Um, it also uh, gives you a default styling framework and so forth. So the, the default safe stack is quite opinionated. There's a bare bones version of it as well that doesn't have these things. Um, and then it gives you a shared project with types and functions that can be used on both the server and the client. And this can be really useful, for example, um, if you have not just type definitions that you can use for communicating between the server and the client and, and to reuse the same types in both of these uh, worlds, but to also have the ability to share functions, it can be very useful for stuff like uh, discount calculations, for example. So this is something that you have to run on the server because like this involves prices and you don't want to trust the client because you don't control that execution environment. You have to calculate these on the server. But it's really nice if you can use the same code to calculate the exact same discount rules on the client as well um, so that you can give immediate feedback to the user, for example. Um, and this is something that, because the same code is, is used uh, and, and the same language is used on the web front end and the uh, back end, uh, that uh, it then easily works in the safe stack. Uh, finally, there's also a Webpack setup for you prepared with hot reloading so that during development, stuff reloads automatically, but also is bundled correctly and minified and stuff like that for production. Um, this is really useful for very quickly getting up to speed in, in uh, an app a web application, basically. Um, just a, a quick overview over the, couple, over the bits and pieces that we'll see in the uh, example in a, in a second. Uh, so the server is this HTTP server that is basically mapping routes um, like uh, API slash API get to do's to a function. In this case, that uh, in the default application setup, it gives you a very, very simple to-do list app. So it's a function that takes unit, so no value in particular, and returns the list of current to-dos. And add to-do, which takes a to-do, adds it to the, uh, the list of, of maintained to-dos, and then returns it again. Um, the HTTP server that's set up there can also serve files, so it will also serve the index HTML and so forth in an efficient way, which is nice so that you don't need an Nginx or something like that in front of it. Um, the single page application, so this is the web app that runs in your browser, uh, written in F Sharp, but transpiled to JavaScript. Um, I assume that there will be some people who have uh, not worked with Elm and the Elmish uh, uh, and the Elm architecture, so I'll briefly explain that so you have a rough idea of what's going on. Um, the basic idea of Elm for web apps is um, that F Sharp copied with Elmish is that you have a type for your model that describes the state of your web application like in the, the most reduced version possible. So for uh, our very simple to-dos app, it's the list of to-dos that we currently display and what's currently in the input field. So this is basically what, what are the ca characters that are currently typed. Uh, then you have a message type. So this is a discriminated union that describes all the things that can possibly happen in our application. In this very simple um, to-do application, that's only four things. It's get to do's, uh, got to do's. Sorry, I have a typo here. That's the message that uh, says, uh, I received a list of to-do's from the server. You have set input that's sent whenever the user types something in the text box. Um, then you get an, uh, this message with the new content of the, um, of the text field. Add to do, that's what should happen when the user press clicks the button 
that he's done and he wants to add this to do and then add it to do which is the message that comes when the server has acknowledged that it has received the to do and you get it back um, then you have uh, in the Elmish setup you have to provide three functions um, you have init which initializes the model and I'm going to ignore this command part for now. It's not so important for us uh, now. But basically, this is like in the, when I start this web app, what should be the content of our model record? Um, then you have a function called view. This takes the model and a that describes the current state of our application and a dispatch function, which uh, will be the thing that we use in event handlers so that we can trigger sending these messages. And the function, the view function returns a React element. So this is the thing that then gets rendered into the viewport. And uh, this is then like given to React and React renders it uh, into the browser and the user looks at it and interacts with it. And when they click something or type something in or something like that, then we get a message, which is one of these four possible uh, cases. Uh, sent to our update function. So we get the message and the current model. And then what we return is the updated model, how the state should change basically based on this message. And then we put that into the view function again, we update what we render and we show it to the user again and so forth. That's basically what uh, the Elm architecture does and how it's implemented in Elmish. Um, and then there's the shared code. That's the third piece of the puzzle basically. Uh, that just defines the types. And in this particular case, in, in the uh, standard setup for the safe stack, it also gives you an automated way of um, automating a REST API basically for you uh, with these functions that are defined in this interface. So here we have uh, get to do's to retrieve the list of to do's from the server and add to do that we can send one to do with uh, to the server and get, uh, get it back in the reply. Um, and this is sort of the, the setup that uh, running the template will give you. And then I will show uh, in a second what that looks like and how you can modify it then. Okay, do we have any questions? Because otherwise I would switch over to the editor and uh, show a few minutes what that looks like in practice. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, I can uh, stall for a couple of seconds to see if anybody wants to type any or just say that you have a question. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so yes, there's a question. Um, uh, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. I don't, I don't see a name. I just see a handle. Count, count three R measure. I guess I should ask. Okay, what? Okay, no audio. Sorry. What is the generated JavaScript quality like? Oh, I'm curious about this too, as a, as a front end <laughs> um, engineer. Yeah, it's 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 pretty good, I would say. Um, I mean, it it like the idioms of F sharp map relatively cleanly. Um, it also produces source maps, so you can um, find your way through. Um, if if you look at it in the Chrome debugging view, so you see the F sharp code. Um, it's uh, of course then somewhat obfuscated to some degree. So uh, I mean, current functions look a bit funky and so forth. So um, it's yeah, it, it, it like in if you write if you don't optimize for very legible JavaScript code, then some of the idioms will look a bit funny. But yeah, in general, I would say it's it's uh, better than I mean, it's, it definitely looks a lot more idiomatic than what you get out of Elm, for example. Okay, it looks like no follow-up question. Okay. Thank you. And I think that's it for questions for right now. Cool. So um, I'll try to uh, not take too long. Um, so just a couple of minutes to show you what this looks like in an actual uh, working setup. Um, so here I have the uh, .NET Core framework installed. Uh, I mean, I use Windows here, but that works on OS X and Linux as well. Um, I have VS Code, I have the Ionite plugin, which is a, um, a community uh, project um, that provides the editor tooling for um, F Sharp. Uh, and I also have this very, this brand new notebook for VS Code extension um, that uh, gives us these uh, Jupyter style uh, notebooks that are nice for data science. This is a pre-release, I think. Uh, also, not everything like works yet as well as I would like to. I wanted to show you some graphs 
but that's broken for me at the moment. But this is something that's like, there is uh, quite a bit of movement there in the last few months. And I think that story will only get better. And so I, I thought I'll, I'll show you this part as well. Um, can we, uh, Steve, can you quickly give me feedback if the editor is large enough? Uh, or should I make it a bit bigger? Well, it's, um, I mean, so, I can read it, but it's probably a bit small, to yeah. be honest. Okay, let's uh, maybe bump it up one more. Yeah, okay. One more and step. Then, that looks pretty decent to me. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, here I have a repo. I'll share that uh, in, with you in the, it's on GitHub. Um, so you can have a look at this yourself on your own time if you like. Um, the idea that I had here was let's try to solve a very small real world problem so you can see what, what this looks like. Um, I'm using these uh, Jupyter notebooks here, but these could also be done as FSx scripts. That's the F sharp code that's not compiled, but just run uh, immediately as scripts. <clears throat> but I thought it's uh, it's maybe kind of nice to explore this as well. And the little challenge that I set myself is let's try to get historical weather data for Berlin and uh, figure out some like highest temperatures, lowest temperatures, some kind of stuff like that, and then turn it into a little web app. So um, this thing is super bare bones, but I think it shows uh, quite well what this can look like in, in practice. So if you've never worked with these uh, Jupyter style notebooks, these are basically ways that you can have uh, interspersed code and markdown cells um, so that you can do this kind of literate programming where you can have markdown cells to describe what you're doing and then code cells that you can execute. Um, let's do this now. So here I just defined two variables with the file names. Then I use the system.net web client to download. Um, so I, I found this meteostat.net website, which is pretty nice. Um, they provide um, historical data for um, uh, a lot of uh, weather stations. And to understand which uh, weather station you want to download it for, you first have to download this JSON that's gzipped uh, that has information on all the weather stations. So I'm using the web client here to download that file. So you can see it popped up here now, uh, and it's gzipped. Um, so now I, uh, the .NET framework has a, a framework function to unzip files that are packed with the zip format, but not for the GSA, uh, gzip format. So I wrote a little helper function in here um, that because the .NET framework does have a stream processing uh, library for gzip streams, but not for gzip files. So I uh, added a little uh, helper function, put it into a script file. This is how you load these um, and then call a function from there. So I run this now and it will unzip the gzip file uh, and put it into the JSON file. So if we now have a look at this, um, you can see that um, it's a relatively uh, boring JSON file. It's an array of records and then um, they have fields like ID and then name and name can apparently be in different languages and then a country and so forth. Okay, so, uh, so far so good. Um, let's use a JSON provider. So this is a, a type provider from the f -sharp data project. And uh, what it will do is I point it to my station uh, stations JSON uh, file. I use this uh, weird looking thing here because depending on the execution model, like how this is actually run on different platforms, sometimes it can end up looking in a slightly wrong directory and this is annoying. So this thing makes sure that this doesn't happen. Um, and then I initialize the JSON provider by looking at an example file. So here I just use the same file for both the example and then to load the actual data. But you could also just extract a couple of these records uh, as into the example file and then it uh, compiles a bit faster. If we run this now, then it will realize, okay, you use this, I reference a library here. Let's make sure that this is installed, then open it and run this uh, code to uh, understand the example file. It's a bit slow here now. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay, somehow the screen sharing or something like that seems to really slow down my laptop that usually doesn't take quite as long. Jesus. Okay, here we go. And uh, now we can uh, print out the um, first element of the, chases, uh, of the stations array, if we want. Uh, but the nice thing is that uh, because F Sharp has now uh, created types for me in the background, is that I get autocomplete here on all of these fields, right? So it looked at the 
uh, at the JSON example and created the types for me so that I didn't have to write them. So if I, for example, say, what's the country of the first element, then it will say it's a string called NO. And uh, this is an array, so I can also use, um, if I say stations.length is the member function of arrays, uh, the member property, um, and if I run this, then it will tell me how many elements does this array have. And it's like 30,403 uh, station records, right? And this is like pretty neat because um, yeah, for, for just this very uh, fast, uh, like interactive uh, understanding, these kind of uh, uh, fields and so forth, that's very nice if you can get the, the uh, safety of the types, but without having to spell them out. Um, so here we create a lazy sequence where we iterate over the records in the station. And then um, this is a bit peculiar uh, to this particular data source. So apparently um, some of these uh, fields were, so we're now at the station.name, we get autocomplete for this, right? So station.name, we want the English identifier. And then in here, it uh, the type provider constructed a type that can either be a number or a string. So probably somewhere in the 34,000 records, there is one particular field that's a number, I guess. Um, so we have to say, okay, uh, if we have the string value, uh, that's an option value. And if this is the case, so not the number, but we have the string case, then we wanna look at this. And if this value starts with the value Berlin, then we want to yield it and uh, print uh, basically what we have here, right? And so if we run this, then we get this output below and in here, where we have all the stations um, that are in there that start with Berlin. And then we can pick one of those. So for example, Berlin Tempelhof. And now in the next uh, notebook, have a look at what it looks like to investigate this. Down below, I have a few uh, pieces of alternative syntax that you can look, on, uh, look at uh, on your own if you like. So here, there is the weather uh, notebook. Um, so this one then tries to download the weather, the historical daily weather data for one particular station ID. So I picked one here. I think that's the one for Berlin Tempelhof. Um, and so if we run through all of these uh, cells real quick, then here I define a function that will uh, create the download URL given a particular station identifier. Um, here I set up a couple of file names. I think I walked past this weather station the other day. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, yeah, because I, I was in Tempelhof and I saw a sign that said Berlin Weather Station in the middle of the park. Yeah, you will be surprised how far back this uh, weather data series go, goes. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the data for this weekend coming up is especially important to us because it's a, it's a three day weekend for us in Berlin. <laughs> Okay, and so uh, here I now do the downloading of this file and you can see that we now have popped up here the Berlin weather.csv file. So this is something that we got now. Okay, and now for a third uh, little notebook that will look at the CSV file. Um, notice that this is a bit of an odd CSV file, it goes back to 1931. Um, so quite a while, but it doesn't have any uh, column headers, which is a bit annoying. Um, uh, and that will uh, make it necessary to uh, hand annotate the schema a bit more than you usually have to. Uh, but here I have a third uh, um, notebook that then uh, uses the CSV uh, type provider. So here I uh, set, the, uh, set up the file name and load the, um, the F sharp data library. Again, takes a bit longer than I had hoped. Okay, and now I use the CSV provider and you can see back here, I define the schema and I give new names to the columns and so forth, just as a convenience uh, for, for us here. Uh, usually that, that gets inferred if there's column headers, um, it would take it from there, but in this case um, it doesn't. And so this is what I uh, decided to do. And so again, um, if I uh, take now here, if I take the rows and I take the last item of the sequence, for example, and then uh, also here I get um, immediately these, so it figured out the types based on the example. And then I can say like for the last row, like what was the date of that? And then I can run this and it will 
uh, figure out. Okay, so the last date that I have here in this particular example is the 22nd, uh, the 27th of February. And uh, let's have a look at the maximum temperature that day. Uh, oh, it wasn't recorded. Okay, uh, well, too bad. <laughs> so we have the average temperature. No, okay. Let's have a look at the last 20, uh, last 10 rows. So for some reason, some of these uh, values seem to be none. Okay, yeah, so the last, last value given for some reason is not a number, uh, but the other ones you can see. Um, because all of this integration with the notebooks is quite new, the F Sharp data provider hasn't really been adapted to do something nicer than just returning tuples for the rows. Uh, so I think that this is something that will come. So at the moment we don't get the uh, nicer uh, labels here in cases like this. So I also added uh, my own type with uh, nice names that I give here. And then I wrote a bit more code that just uh, filters, goes through the average temperature of the day and filters the one um, that are like from the highest average temperature to the lowest and then takes the first 20 rows uh, and puts it into our own record so that the uh, labels here uh, are a bit nicer, just so that uh, you can see a bit how this would work in practice. And then you can have a look at the values here and you can see that the highest average temperature for the entire day was 30.5 degrees Celsius and that was on uh, in July 20, uh, 2010. Okay, so far so good. You can play with that a bit on your own if you like uh, by checking out the GitHub repo. But the last thing that I want to show you here before I stop is um, the repo is in a, done in a couple of Git um, uh, commits that you can go through. Um, and I started with adding the first three notebooks one by one. And then I have a commit here where I run the .NET uh, new safe uh, uh, command to create all the files that uh, are uh, part of the safe stack template. And that gives you then this application that you can run down here, .NET fake build t run. So this is the somewhat strange invocation to actually run this. It's documented in a readme um, that will then run the Webpack setup and the uh, Fable compiler to compile the front end code and uh, .NET, the normal .NET compiler to compile the backend code, wire it all together, and uh, make it uh, easy to uh, makes it easy to uh, look at this application and edit it in real time. Uh, and then you have all the files here that are generated. So I quickly talked about these in the slides before, right? So this is the to do app that you get in the default setup of the template, where the to do is defined in the shared code and the API for the two uh, parts to talk together. And then there's a server implementation that um, keeps the storage just in memory, adds a couple of default to-dos, uh, implements the API, and then sets up the web server. So it's, uh, what, 50 lines of code or so. And then you have the client, which is a bit uh, slightly more code, which implements the React uh, component with the Elmish model. Um, OK, the, somehow the editor tooling hasn't caught up yet to the changes. Uh, in the Git, doesn't matter. Um, and so if I, yeah, it's not quite done, it's still compiling. The first compile takes like, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds usually. Now with the my poor laptop with the screen sharing, it takes a bit longer apparently. Um, but yeah, we, we will be able to play with this in a second. And uh, then uh, maybe as a, as a heads up, so what you'll find in the Git repo, the last uh, commit then um, is one where I make all the changes that are involved in stripping out the to-do app and replacing it with a very simple weather data uh, gathering application. So I use uh, fragments of the code that I developed in the, um, in the notebooks before. I put them into various places. I take out, I replaced, for example, here, we can have a look at what that looks like then. Uh, the shared code, so before it was the to-do, now I say the shared type that I wanna have is my weather data row. And my API is just get me the highest 20 temperature days. And so it's a very simple thing. It doesn't do much, uh, anything fancy, um, uh, but the same on the client, it renders these a bit uh, more nicely, gives you a button to retrieve them. Um, I wanted to add some filtering, haven't gotten around to that. But just so you get an idea of like how quickly you can go from, I just do some data science, or I mean, 
a big word, but just some data, simple data manipulation to, I want to have a web app that uh, serves this up and that then is a good uh, baseline that I can very quickly iterate on and produce a very like well-designed modern web app that uh, will be able to, uh, to, to uh, bring me quite a while in, in terms of complexity and so forth and uh, play with that. And, and um, it has the, <clears throat> all the, um, all the build script involved to publish this. So you can uh, run it and it will pack, package all of that for you. So you can just put it into a Docker container and publish it, publish it somewhere or put it on a web server that has the .NET framework runtime installed. Um, okay, so we're still waiting. Again, usually this takes like 20, 25 seconds or so. Now it takes more like three minutes. Um, maybe one more item while we wait and then it should be done soon is that uh, the build uh, uh, script is also uh, an F-sharp script. So um, you can use the same types, the full power of the language to write your um, build scripts. And there is a project called Fake, um, which is the F-sharp make basically, um, that gives you a bunch of um, uh, helper functions to set up build steps and to define how to sequence them. Uh, so that you define the dependencies here with a bit of a somewhat strange, but like a DSL to define these dependencies, but it works. Um, and the really cool thing about this is that all of this is the exact same language. So um, what I found is that the developers in F-sharp, because they can use the same language to write web front-end code, web, like back-end code, but also even the built uh, script, it's like you never have this mental burden of like, oh, now I have to switch into TypeScript, but I was just in Python uh, on the web backend, and now I have to write the bash script to munch it all together and so forth. Um, you can just stay within the, the whole, uh, within one language for the entire um, uh, setup. So if we now finally go to our little um, uh, application. So this is the to-do uh, application that you get by default. Um, test this, add, this sends it to the server, comes back, it's added to the list. Uh, it's a super infuriating to-do app because you can only add tasks and never delete them or mark them completed. So it's like the first thing that you will want to do is add the code to delete, be able to delete them. Um, but now that I've uh, shown you this, you can play with this. Um, if you have the Redux uh, dev tools installed, you can look at the state transitions and state changes uh, in this interactively and so forth. So there's quite some, uh, some pretty nice ed uh, like tooling around this whole experience. And let me just quickly switch to the last uh, point in the, uh, in the Git. Uh, there's a couple of files that the F-sharp tooling likes to change, and then that can be a, <clears throat> a problem in switching ahead uh, between different commits. Does it work now? It's not an annoying to-do list app. It's an honest to-do list app. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's true. But maybe sometimes tasks get done. I would like to think so. Uh, okay, and so this is like the super simple change that I did. So just basically, so you can see the divs for what's what's required here, and then it has a button to say get highest temperatures. Um, my server hasn't restarted yet; it's a bit slow. Come on! Are you going to tell us what we have in store for the weekend? No, sorry, I only did the, did the past data. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can tell you what last weekend was like. <laughs> I lived through it. It wasn't bad, except for Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for some reason, this is still hanging here, um, trying uh, compiling the backend. Uh, we have a few questions. Yes. Um, is it a good time for questions while you're yes, waiting for that? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, my good friend Jonathan has a couple of questions. If you would like to unmute Jonathan, please go ahead and ask them. Uh, sure. Hey, um, I'm actually just about to leave, but um, I was going to ask, what are some recommended libraries for doing SQL interop? Uh, and then also the same for unit testing or just integration testing, those kinds of, you know, day-to-day -day kind of things. Yeah. So um, for testing, I think the Expecto library is, uh, is a really nice one. Um, it comes with all kinds of bells and whistles. Um, it also integrates with FS check, which is a quick check um, 
property-based testing style uh, library um, that's really useful. Uh, and so that's what I would do for testing. Um, and for SQL, uh, it depends a bit. There's a bunch of approaches, um, like there's type providers that look at the database schema. Um, again, very nice for quick uh, development, um, maybe a bit problematic for a long time, very code that has to be solid uh, for, for and maintained for a long time. Um, there's a bunch of libraries for just simple, if you just want very simple mappings for um, writing your own SQL and just a slightly uh, nicer way of uh, executing the SQL commands. Um, there is dapper.fsharp. Dapper is a simple mapper for um, F sharp rec or, or C sharp classes, um, basically, but then there's an F sharp version that, that works very well with records uh, that just does the mapping for you from, uh, I have a type here and I did a SQL query that queries a table that has the same schema. Uh, I don't want to do the like uh, alignment by hand. Uh, you go figure it out uh, kind of style. And um, yeah, and then there's a, yeah, there's, um, I can I can look it up. I, I don't know the the uh, there's a very bare bones but useful uh, SQL interop library, and then there are some that are quite a lot more magic, um, but that I have never used. There's like the entity framework, which is this Microsoft offering that's very ORM style. Uh, we do a lot of magic for you, uh, and you never have to write raw SQL. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, ping me up again if you want to know the exact names of the real SQL libraries, then I can uh, write them together in a quick overview. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, Ulrich has a few more questions. Sure. Well, actually, I think you already answered it. Uh, I had a question about the tools and, and dependency management tools. So what you showed us was, is that a standard approach or is that just for the special um, safe framework? Um, no, I would say it's quite standard. So, so um, with the .NET Core framework, you get the .NET um, um, uh, command line tool, um, and that comes with the basic NuGet uh, package management. Um, that works well enough for small packages, but then there is the Pakit package manager that's also used in this setup. Um, that is uh, a bit more principled. It does it uses log files by default um, uh, and so forth. Uh, NuGet has gotten better in the last year or two, but uh, yeah, so Pakit for package managing is, is uh, something that's often added for uh, slightly more complex projects. And the fake build scripts are also something like this. So like for, for small projects, just .NET build, .NET run uh, works well. Um, once you get to a point where, like, like in cases like this, where you have several pieces in your build that you have to coordinate, then like the fake build language is, is a pretty standard solution in F Sharp land. Thanks. Over you had a question about pure functions as well, if you want to ask that one. Oh, okay, sorry, it was already answered here in the, in the chat. So I, I had to question if there's any... For the, benefit, for the benefit of posterity. Yeah, so you, you can see in the type or in the signature if a function is pure or not. No, unfortunately not. Um, it's uh, the .NET framework is just uh, doesn't have this kind of information. And so everything is potentially um, side effectful. Okay, KK has a question. Oh, hi there. Um, yeah, I was wondering uh, if uh, you could say something about uh, whether computation expressions can be can be combined. Uh, so let's say I want to use uh, async with, I don't know, something else, option or, or maybe even like three or four effects. Uh, it looks like I have to use these uh, expression uh, blocks. Um, so how would I how would I use like several of them together? I, I mean, I'm thinking of sort of like in Haskell, there's obviously transformer steps yeah. and things like this. Yeah. yeah. So um, in F sharp, um, you basically don't have that. You have to implement all the permutations of combinations that you want to use like this yourself uh, as a com new computation expression, which is annoying in practice. Um, it's um, a bit less of a problem than in Haskell because it, like people bite the bullet that like code is potentially side effectful and like the most like important ones are usually picked and then provided again as a library. So for example, there is a library called FS uh, toolkit error handling that gives you um, the combinations for 
um, dealing with the, uh, like combining the option and the result uh, computation expressions with async uh, and task and um, gives you traverse and stuff like that uh, over these particular uh, few permutations. Um, this is a bit annoying. Um, and it's like one of those things where a lot of people who know these things from other languages are, I think, quite frustrated with F sharp when they come to it, because I mean, also it doesn't have high kind of types and so forth. Um, but I think that it's sort of this, at some point it, it, it has to be this way because the .NET framework doesn't have the capability to encode these kind of information in the types. Uh, and F sharp wants to be very compatible to the normal .NET framework. Um, and on the other hand, I think it's also to some degree a conscious decision to say, um, there is just an a limit to the abstraction ceiling that we, we wanna have. So it's, it's not as extreme as with Elm, of course. Um, but it's like somewhat of a, of a similar vibe of like, maybe the trade-off, like the, the point in the design space where we wanna live is, is okay right here where you have to write the permutations out yourself. Um, and finally, there is a, a library called um, FS plus, I think, which gives you a generic monad uh, computation expression. And I think if I remember com correctly, uh, you can do more powerful automatic combinations um, of uh, computation expressions with that one, but I haven't used it much, so I can't really say. Thank you. Sure. Okay, no more questions in the chat at the moment. Um, I was going to ask about uh, your background and how you came to FP. I, I feel like I remember that you don't have like a traditional CS background. I'm maybe misremembering. Yeah, that's true. Um, I basically just started programming. So there's a, 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 I went to school in Austria and there's a special school type where um, instead of the normal high school from 14 to 19, uh, and then you can go to university, you do one more year until you're 19 and you also get sort of a vocational training. Um, and I did that for IT. So um, I had five years of like C, C++, Java, um, PL1, um, IBM mainframe assembler, like weird stuff like that. Um, and, but basically a, a, a decent uh, basic computer science uh, uh, education, not, not quite a Bachelor of Computer Science, but not too far off. Um, and then I started working and I, um, that was, I think the year I started working was the year that the .NET framework on Windows was announced. And then I did um, f f uh, until 2014 or so, I worked uh, as a C-sharp developer doing Windows uh, forms uh, applications mostly, um, Windows UI programs, and then uh, bits and pieces of various other pieces of technology, but that was my main thing. And I had a good friend who uh, in the late 2000s got very much into Haskell and uh, kept telling me about it. And uh, I was also studying film uh, directing at that time. So I didn't really have much free time. And I always thought it was very weird what he told me and intriguing, but I didn't really have the time to look into it. And then in 2013-ish, um, I started uh, myself getting really interested in uh, functional programming and uh, learning a bit of Haskell, F Sharp in parallel, um, doing quite a bit of, um, uh, this F, uh, F Sharp for Fun and Profit website existed back then already. And I thought it was a very good website that taught me a lot of stuff. It's just a very interesting general for FP principles, a very good introductory site. Um, and then uh, did some pure script and Elm um, and then got hired uh, into my current job uh, because of my uh, activity in the Elm uh, forum. And then at some point we said, okay, we want to use something uh, in, in, on the backend that's also a nice uh, statically typed functional programming language. We evaluated a bunch of stuff and then decided at some point to use F Sharp on uh, both backend and front end. And so that's roughly my, my story. I think it was the film directing thing I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, looks like you got some results. Yes. Uh, I mean, again, like this is just a super basic uh, example, but I just wanted to include a diff for like, what are the changes that you have to make if you then want to use something like the, uh, the, the data that we uh, read in through the type provider. And yeah, if you want to look at this uh, repo, then uh, it's on my GitHub. 
uh, make this bigger. Uh, come on. I didn't want to open the picture. Uh, top, 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 top. F sharp demo. And so this is the, the repo that um, you can clone and uh, you should be able to run this on pretty much any platform if you have the .NET Core um, SDK installed and uh, Node uh, for running the tooling. I think there's also a VS Code container setup that you, uh, not in this one, but that could also be done. So if you don't want to install all these things uh, and want to instead run VS Code with the development containers, uh, there is a setup for the safe stack for this as well. I, I, I'll add this uh, later, maybe today. OK. We have three more questions sure. for, for yeah. now. We might, we might have more. So uh, uh, Ulrich gets the gold medal tonight for question. Yeah, sorry for being so obnoxious. No, here. totally. Um, yeah, the, we, in the intro to the language, you mentioned about uh, iterations and loops. Mm -hmm. so I was wondering, is is that because the .NET doesn't have proper tail calls, or does uh, it does the tail calls exist? And it does, depending on the runtime. I have to say, so um, the .NET Core uh, def uh, framework definitely has it. Um, so there, if uh, you have a recursion in the tail position. Uh, you get uh, tail call elimination uh, by the F# -sharp compiler um, and the .NET uh, runtime. Um, I'm not 100% sure right now if the uh, JavaScript uh, transpiler takes care of that correctly. I, that, that would actually be an interesting question. Um, Chrome doesn't have it. Edge doesn't have it. I think only Safari has proper tail calls. They, they, they might uh, implement it and, and output a state machine or something like that that uh, takes care of the recursion manually, basically. But I, I'm not sure. I, I will have to look this up. This is an interesting question. Um, I also know that there was, at some point, I think, a version of the .NET framework on Windows, uh, I think the 32-bit one or so, at some point, didn't have tail call elimination. So maybe that's also uh, was was one of the motivating reasons to to um, add to have loops very early on. Um, but yeah, but you have both, you and you can use both usually quite effortlessly. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ulrich. And Berndt has a question. Actually, maybe I'll just ask this one. It's a very simple one. Is there a group that you're aware of in Berlin for F# -sharp continuous learning? Uh, no, I don't know. But if there's an interest, uh, maybe we could, um, I don't know, find some people together. There is, um, so it, the um, F Sharp has a, um, a website that the F Sharp Software Foundation, which is the foundation that takes care of the language. Um, so uh, Microsoft sponsors uh, the main developer and plus a few people uh, for the Visual Studio tooling, I think. Um, but then the language steering uh, and uh, so forth is all in this independent um, um, uh, organization. And they have a Slack channel, for example, um, uh, that you can join and a forum and so forth. So if you are learning F Sharp and want to hang out with a few people, um, that would probably be the, the um, uh, most useful thing right now. But if there's enough interest, um, like drop me a line and maybe we can um, we can organize something if there's enough people interested in doing that in, in Berlin. Yeah, and feel free to exploit this group if you want. Yeah. For any uh, FP or learning purpose whatsoever. Okay, uh, another question that I need to read. Uh, did you evaluate ML or OCaml out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, we, so ML, we didn't um, really evaluate for that purpose. Um, we evaluated OCaml and Reason ML. Um, for the things that we wanted to do, we had the feeling that the um, backend library ecosystem in OCaml was um, a bit too fragile in a way, or like just a lot of stuff that we knew that we were probably going to need wasn't there. And in the .NET ecosystem, a lot of stuff is written in C Sharp and has a sort of a mutable feel to it, but it gets the job done. And so that was one of the um, reasons why we decided to go with F Sharp in the end. 
but yeah, one of the one of the people in our group was actually um, he worked a lot with OCaml as well. So um, he's at the, in Ljubljana at the university there, and they they have a pretty strong OCaml group. They just recently rename Reason or. Oh, that's possible. I, 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 I know they re they renamed it from Reason ML to Reason, and then I thought they renamed it again, but maybe okay. I'm remembering. I don't know. Um, KK has exactly the question that I have. Uh, yeah, <laughs> really. Okay, so yeah, just uh, wondering. You mentioned that you uh, evaluated Haskell as well. So, what was it about F Sharp that won you won you over? Um. So partly it was um, that we had used Elm before in the front end, and um, we thought that the transition from the people like we had a we were six developers, and uh, funnily two of them had OCaml experience, so F Sharp was uh, relatively easy for them uh, to, to to make the transition. Um, and then we had used uh, as as this group uh, Elm before uh, for some of our front end stuff, and uh, we had the feeling that the uh, front end story of F Sharp with Fable and like Elmish and so forth was pretty close to our experience with um, with Elm. Only that you have more freedom because the uh, JavaScript FFI works very well. Uh, whereas Elm is, of course, very strict in that they don't want you to uh, be able to interop with normal JavaScript in any way other than sending messages and then having a separate uh, part of the on the JavaScript side that, that translates these messages into JavaScript calls. Um, and we had a look at, at Haskell and uh, GHCJS, but we felt that it's a pretty, it, it's a significantly larger jump um, from knowing Elm and OCaml to Haskell with uh, like uh, non-strict evaluation semantics and so forth and GHCS, which felt a bit more, I don't know, just um, like very large bundle sizes back then. I don't know what the story is today and so forth. So we felt like F Sharp is probably sort of middle ground that will make us um, the happiest, the quickest. Yeah, Does that make sense? sense? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Yep, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Okay, that's it for questions. Uh, did you have any closing uh, remarks or examples? Um, I think I, sorry, this is the wrong slide. I think I have two more slides here, just so, I mean, basically nothing spe uh, special. Um, just, um, I, it was a good experience for us, I would say. Um, I mean, it's just a pretty solid language. Um, it, it works well, it's useful. Um, many other languages are great as well, of course, um, but this worked for us. Um, there's a couple of things that were not so great. Um, like for example, the documentation story is a bit all over the place. Um, once you've seen something like Rust, um, then uh, you're, you're a bit sad in a lot of other languages, I feel. Um, it's just that it's very different. Like every project solves this again for themselves. Um, and so the documentation is uh, like quality differs and like how it's presented and so forth differ quite a lot. Um, the community is, is a lot smaller than in some other languages. And so sometimes you just, you, you more often run into issues that apparently no one has used this particular corner of the library yet. So uh, <laughs> then there is uh, some issue with, with some edge case. Um, and the meta programming solutions are not very good. Um, so there is these type providers, but they're a bit of a pain to develop, I heard. I've never tried it myself. Um, mostly because of this like sort of um, versioning story and so forth. Um, and there is not really anything um, that like uh, Haskell gives you with generic uh, uh, deriving or Rust gives you with their derive uh, capabilities and so forth. Or of course, closures with macros and so forth. Um, so uh, that's a bit sad sometimes. Um, there is a code generation library that's pretty good, but yeah, so-so. <laughs> um, I also have a couple of links. So these slides are, um, maybe I'll, I'll put uh, this and the GitHub uh, repo directly into the, um, into the chat. Um, so the slides are at slides.com slash Daniel Bachler, um, why I like F Sharp. Um, and here are a bunch of links uh, that I recommend for if you want to dive into this. Um, the fourth one here is a blog post of mine uh, that I also posted in the meetup group, What I Wish I Knew When Learning F Sharp, where I collected a bunch of resources if you want to get started, uh, a couple of gotchas that you may want to look out for. 
Uh, and maybe uh, another mention, if you uh, have never uh, heard about Elm or um, Elmish and these concepts, then the Elmish book is a great resource um, to look at the F-sharp implementation of it and get familiar with the whole stack and, and way of developing web apps like that. Yeah, and I think uh, that's it for, for me. Thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, I'm very glad that so many people were interested in F-sharp. Yeah, thank you so much for introducing it to us. Um, I kind of had this thought that maybe only people doing, I don't know, enterprise applications for Windows were using F Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was definitely true 10 years ago, but uh, so luckily that changes. Okay, well, you've, con you've convinced me that it's uh, it's safe and fun to use F Sharp on any platform for any kind of application. I'm actually yeah. quite curious about this F Sharp React um, connection now. Yeah. Now check it out. I mean, I think it's really it's it's quite nicely done. So, um, and it's it's quite actively developed also. So, um, there's a lot of stuff happening. I mean, it's also like part of the the friction. Um, so, uh, Fable, which is the F sharp uh, compiler that um, does uh, the translation to JavaScript, they have uh, gone through three major versions, and the safe stack demo that I showed you uses still version two. Um, and that is because version three now does things entirely different. So version two was done as a distributed as an NPM package and uh, produced a Babel AST and then let Babel output JavaScript. And the new version is done as a .NET tool and outputs JavaScript uh, like text directly, which is a lot faster, but also has some issues now with like, how do you integrate it in Webpack and so forth. So there's some, some uh, bits and pieces that are, <laughs> that are moving and uh, as with many ecosystems where things are a bit annoying. But uh, if you stay with the safe stack for now, um, I think that's a pretty good solid uh, setup that works well. Yeah, I mean, it's in the name. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like you actually, like you actively recommend F Sharp as um, like a language for functional programming beginners. I mean, it seems to me just from your presentation that it has a lot of the features that we, we like in functional programming, even if it doesn't have the more esoteric ones, but a lot of the familiarity from uh, other languages, like uh, it's like sort of getting into a warm bath. Yeah. I mean, Haskell so, is not comfortable to learn. I mean, I, I love Haskell, but it's definitely a system shock if you're coming from totally different paradigms. Yeah, no, I would definitely say so. Um, I mean, I think that it's a bit similar to how Elm can be a stepping stone to Haskell as well for people who don't wanna like go full on into the uh, mono transformer stacks and stuff like that. Um, and I feel like uh, F Sharp also works well for this intermediate area. And it's it's because it's so pragmatic, you can also write code that's not maybe super idiomatic F Sharp that uses a lot of loops, that uses stateful objects and so forth. But if that's what it takes to get you into the functional world, then I mean, it's fine with me. Um, and I think it's a bit more uh, it, it's, it's on the other hand, a bit more opinionated than Scala, which also I think lives in this uh, intersection between object oriented and functional, but uh, where I think Scala is relatively open and a lot of people program in styles all over the place in Scala. I mean, I've never programmed Scala in any capacity. I just view it from an, as an outsider, but that's the feeling that I had. And I think in F sharp, there's a relatively clear possibility to use a lot of stuff, but a strong um, preference to use functions and immutable values and keep it simple. Well, cool. I'm glad that we had this opportunity to um, have you speak to us, especially since you're speaking to us from Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I expect that we're gonna get together for a coffee or something one of these days. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me and thank you all for joining. Uh, that was great. I'll post the links in the on the meetup comments page. I think that's maybe easier because the chat uh, might be gone. Oh yes, yes, please. Thanks very much for that. And I will also put it on the uh, the video when I post it to YouTube. Perfect.